Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cellular Healing TV. I'm your host, Meredith Dykstra, and this is episode number 159. Today, we have, of course, Dr. Dan Pompa, our resident cellular healing specialist on the line, and we're welcoming a very special guest today, Travis Christofferson. We have a really exciting topic. We've, we've delved into this a lot, but uh, Travis wrote an incredible book, and it's all about the truth about cancer. So we're gonna really dig into this a little bit more and um, just kind of the myths surrounding it and what he discovered in, in this really incredible book that he wrote. So before we, we jump in, let me tell you a little bit more about Travis. Travis Christofferson is a science writer and a graduate of the Montana State Honors Program in Molecular Biology. He received the Nelson Fellowship for Outstanding Undergraduate Research and continued graduate research in bioremediation and cancer theory, culminating in an MS in Material Engineering and Science from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. He is the author of the best-selling book, Tripping the Truth, The Metabolic Theory of Cancer. The book offers a historical perspective on the re-emerging metabolic theory of cancer, a theory that contends cancer is precipitated and driven by damage to mitochondria. Very exciting topic. Welcome to Cellular Healing TV, Travis. So excited to have you here. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, Travis, welcome. And, you know, we've had a lot of your uh, friends on the show. Uh, Thomas Safer, you... You were actually at the conference right now uh, down in Tampa, correct? That's right. Yep. Tom's speaking in about an hour and a half, so I'm excited about that. He's going to present new data that everyone's kind of, you know, on the edge of their seat to hear. Yeah, I know Tom, Thomas is, uh, you know, no doubt a friend of this show, and, you know, we've interviewed him. And, you know, I have to say, though, Thomas, I love you, but, you know, his book was over most people's head. I enjoyed it. I dug in deep as you did, I'm sure. However, your book, <laughs> Tripping Over the Truth, I mean, that was, um, I think, brought the message, I think, more clearly for most people. Uh, it was a needed book, so thank you for that, honestly. Um, oh. How did you, I, I love to get into this, you know, how did you get it? What's your story, man? I mean, how did you end up writing a book or a desire to write the book? Well, like you said, I, I was in the middle of graduate school in a cancer theory class, and mm -hmm. had learned, you know, all about the genetic theory that cancer was mm -hmm. through and through a genetic disease. That's what everybody's taught. And so I stumbled on Tom's book, um, Cancer is a Metabolic Disease, and read through it and was just blown away that there was this body of evidence as comprehensive as it was, you know, supposing this alternative theory of cancer. Yeah. And the, his book was really the trigger for me and, and, and kicked off this kind of journey where I was so curious to find out more about it. And, um, Tom had written the science book. I mean, that was there, like you said, but inside that was this beautiful, rich story that goes all the way back to Otto Warburg and yeah. all these characters you know, throughout the century, while this theory was, was uh, you know, one of the most dominant theories at the beginning of the century and then just fell into complete void and was almost ridiculed. And now it's made this incredible comeback. So mm -hmm. I wanted to bridge that gap between the science and the narrative of this wonderful story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're right. I mean, the, the history's there. I mean, Warburg back in 1924, uh, he said, hey, look, this is a damaged mitochondria. The cell's not able to use normal oxygen for energy, just to keep it simple. And therefore, it's relying on this primitive form of taking glucose and fermenting it for energy, right? So we know it's this defective mitochondria. And to survive, the DNA changes. And uh, then all of a sudden it starts this glucose fermentation process that we know leads to other problems. You know, I, I think if you go back to 2006, and I, I know that, you know, this is something that you talked about somewhere in your book. Uh, you know, it was the, the, the Cancer Genome Atlas Project, right? Is that right? I mean, that's, you know, somewhere around that line where they set out, and this reminds me of the Human Genome Project, where they set out in that project to basically, there must be hundreds of thousands of genes in the human species because of all this amazing function that we have. And the scientists, the greatest in the world, walked away going, holy cow, we have about the same as a mouse, about 24, 25,000 genes, right? I mean, it was, it was devastating to the scientific community. The same thing happened. Right. How are viewers about that? Yeah, and, and the same number of genes as a 936-celled worm. 
<laughs> so exactly. it's stunned, right? Which it led to epigenetics as we know it today. What happened in 2006 with the cancer project? Beautiful explanation. And so in my mind, all this research since Watson and Crick discovered DNA in 1953 focused on the, on the genetic code, right? That was going to be, I mean, when they announced the Human Genome Project, this was going to be the end all of medicine. We were going to finally know the script of life. Yeah. Cure, well, we'd know every nook and cranny, but lo and behold, there's this another layer of information above the genome called epigenetics. It turns out this may be very much more important. Um, it turns out there's very little variation from person to person in genes. And, you know, there are a few devastating gene mutations, but those are pretty rare. Yeah. By and large, most of us operate with the same genomes. What makes us so different and unique typically is the different expression of genes, so epigenetics, this new layer of discovery. And that goes back to cancer. Cancer was always thought to be a d d disease of DNA, of fixed mutations. And throughout the 80s and 90s, clinicians who looked at, at cervical cancer and colon cancer, they noticed that cancer proceeded in these graded series of steps. And so the theory was that each one of these defined steps was underpinned by a specific genetic mutation. And so the idea was we thought each type of cancer would have its own sort of unique signature that would define it. So this led to the Cancer Genome Atlas Project where sequencing technology had gotten so good on the heels of the Human Genome Project that it became feasible to actually sequence the genome of cancer cells. And that's what the project was. So I mean, right away. in the project, they thought they were gonna be able to find certain DNA mutations and then say, that's this cancer. Here's a mutation, here's that cancer. That's what they set out to do, what happened. Right, right. According to the somatic mutation theory, the dogmatic theory, each, each what cancer is, is mutations to specific genes called ACA genes that sort of rewire the cellular circuitry towards uncontrolled growth. And they thought each type of cancer would have its own sort of defined signature. So right, the project began in 2006, right away in 2007, what they found was just strikingly random. The degree of heterogeneity from one type, from one patient's tumor to the next was huge. So that tidy little signature was not there. There was even mutate or even samples with one driving mutation or zero driving mutations. So this has caused this kind of, this sort of wholesale rethink about what cancer is, that it cannot just exclusively be a genetic disease. Right. And so it caused cancer researchers to look at this new level of, of epigenetics as a cause of cancer, because I mean, l let's face it, cancer does not appear as a chaotic disease. It appears as a sort of deterministic systemic um, disease. It's operating under certain rules. And, and we use that buzzword epigenetics a lot. So, so what does that mean? I'll just give you one example of that in the cancer cell. So this reversion to the Warburg effect, right? You, we're, we're all born with what's called isozymes of certain genes. So there's one gene called uh, hexokinase, and that catalyzes the first step of glycolysis. So the utilization of sugar, there's 11 steps and that catalyzes the first step. We are all born with four types of this gene called isozymes, one through four. So as adults, we express isozyme one. However, the cancer, cancer cell will revert to hexokinase two. Now this is so important because hexokinase two does not, does not subject to this, this phenomenon called product inhibition. So it's not under any regulation. It just shoves sugar down this pathway. And this, so this is responsible for the Warburg effect. Also that enzyme will bind to the mitochondria and close this channel that's responsible for cell death. And this is called apoptosis. And this is another hallmark feature of cancer, the immortalization of the cell. Right. So this one genetic shift from an enzyme we have within our bodies, um, you know, it's, it's expressed during embryonic development and then shut off and then re-expressed in cancer. And so this epigenetic shift is, is responsible for two hallmark features of cancer. So this, this, you know, these turning on and turning off of genes now is, is the, the hot topic. In, so let me just, every you know, for our viewers sake, because, you know, a, billions of dollars has gone into trying to find the gene and you know drugs to manipulate genes epigenetics you know we talked about this on the show before is basically any environmental stressor can turn on a gene you know we all have genes of cancer trust me we do and other genes of susceptibility but certain factors toxins included that we talk a lot about can trigger a gene now the gene gets turned on. Now this process in the mitochondria changes. Now it's relying on sugar as its primary fuel. 
fermenting glucose, even in the presence of oxygen. And by the way, folks, you don't have to understand that. Just know it's not normal. But it comes from, you know, a mitochondria that, you know, was changed by some stressor, turned on a gene, and now the cell's adapting to live longer. And matter of fact, becomes immortal. Meaning that, guys, when you have bad cells, they, you know, the body can get rid of them. It can change something in the mitochondria, believe it or not, the little fat called cardiolipin. Bam, cell dies. That's great. You lost a bad cell. These cells, that's not happening. So all this is from a stressor changing the genome, and now all these bad things happen. Is that a good summary for our viewers? <laughs> Fantastic. And, you know, you look at the body, and, and that's what we, like this, this process you were talking about of cell death. If you do have mutations, your body is extremely efficient of getting rid of those cells through processing. Right. And every day, you know, billions of cells die and then billions of cells divide via stem cells to replace those cells in our body. So we're this dynamic equilibrium of, of death and renewal that, ha that happens all the time. And yeah, this happens through, through and it's through the exposure of toxins, um, all these sort of things that happen on the day-to-day -day level that cause, cause damaged cells to just sort of slough off. And, and, but occasionally one of these cells does not die. And then this predisposes us towards cancer. You know, my belief is, you know, when I read Warburg's stuff, you know, he talked about the damaged mitochondria. He alluded to certain stressors starting the damage, right? And today, when we look at the amount of toxins uh, that we're exposed to, you know, what we're injecting in ourselves, for goodness sakes, what we're using, you know, in our bodies, the food, you know, that's sprayed with these chemicals, you know, it's unavoidable. But I, I think that what people have to understand is that's what's turning on these genes that's what's changing the genomes in the mitochondria but travis nobody in the science is really looking upstream to those causes you know i mean everyone's just talking about trying to find that miracle drug to change genome but really we know the cause is this this goes back to the 80s and, and when if you look at the history of our tenure with cancer and how we've chosen to treat it in the, in the set, late 70s, we started really pushing chemotherapy. We had a few successes with Hodgkin's disease, testicular cancer, and then Nixon declared the war on cancer in 71. And, you know, we'd landed on the moon. So there's kind of this hubris at the time that we could cure cancer with this, these handful of systemic toxins. So we pushed and pushed and pushed. And we did make a little progress, but then we hit a wall. And then the, the biostatisticians took over in the 80s and go, okay, well, how successful has this war on cancer been? And they started counting. And what they realized is when you count in even all the preventative measures, pap smears, everything we do, all of our new treatments at that point, the cancer rate had increased 9%. So we, we, we're, we're definitely we're losing the war on cancer. We still are. Spiked billions. And, right. And the reason was is we, this, this terrible focus on trying to treat somebody when they come in where the disease has progressed so far versus the, the prevention, which is clearly the best protocol for treatment. And the focus has been on, you're right, exactly, has been on trying to come up with these drugs that will treat end stage disease rather than prevention. And we, you know, we have, there's, there's preventative, um, for cervical cancer, the vaccine, I, I believe is a complete preventative cure, but it gets incredibly little attention. Yeah, interesting. Well, tell me what, what's what's going on at the conference. I mean, you know, you have uh, I think Dominic Diagostino, uh, who we've interviewed on the show, is down there. You have, you know, so what, what's uh, what's going on? I mean, so you know, bring us some of the latest. <laughs> yeah, so there was there's been a lot of fascinating talks. Um, ones that come to mind are treatment. You know, tons of stuff about ketones and ketone bodies. It's the Metabolic Therapeutics Conference. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of stuff on Alzheimer's. There was a wonderful talk about the use of MCT oil in mitigating Alzheimer's, and it looks like it's efficacious. Anytime we can raise ketone bodies, it's bypassing the pathology in, in many diseases, including Alzheimer's. And so, uh, you know, the miracle of these little compounds just continue to come in, and that's what we see. Another talk on beta-hydroxybutyrate that, prevents this assembly of what they call the inflammasome. And, and by the way, that's a ketone, beta-hydroxybutyrate for our viewers. Right, right. Um, are they probably familiar with the ketogenic diet? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, good. Right, so so another, another 
astonishing thing with ketosis is the prevention of the systemic inflammation, which yeah. we're, we need it for infection, but it can get out of control and be the precipitate many disease process. So um, those two stuck in my mind. Today, Tom's going to present Tom Seyfried on cancer. Um, there's, you know, there's exogenous ketones are coming online. There's a lot of talk about those. So yeah, lots of interesting stuff. Yeah, so we do, uh, you know, we've trained a, a growing group of practitioners around the country. And, you know, we do a multi-therapeutic approach with my cellular detox. But we utilize ketosis as a tool, intermittent fasting and even block fast like Tom does. Uh, so Tom and I have been able to share a lot of thoughts and, you know, because we have a large group to work with and, you know, Tom is really doing some amazing work with fasting and, you know, for our viewers, you know, that just, it's forcing bad cells don't adapt. You know, I, I love to, to say that because it's really simple autophagy, you know, where the cells are, <clears throat> the body's getting rid of the bad cells that happens in fasting. It forces ketones really high, which as you just pointed out, drives inflammation down and, you know, changes DNA. Uh, a lot of Dominic's work, you know, is showing that it's changing these bad genes. Turn off. We're talked about genes being turned on. Ketones have the ability to turn off some of these genes. So, you know, putting all this together, I mean, I, I think we're in an exciting time, Travis. I mean, what, what do you think about that? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, just as you were talking about that, I, I was thinking Walter Longo gave a talk too about intermittent fasting. Mm. And when you do that, you, you, your organs that well, when you fast for a long period of time, your organs actually will become smaller in size and your, your immune system, the number of immune cells decreases. Then when you wow. re, you repopulate those tissues with uh, fresh stem cells. So it's like you get this fresh renewed organ almost or immune system at that point. So yeah. incredible things that he talked about was astonishing is the importance of IGF one, which is, are familiar with human growth hormone. Human growth hormone really doesn't do anything, but it docks to a receptor, which produces IGF-1, and mm -hmm. that's the anabolic hormone that promotes growth. Right. And so this is, it's always been known that IGF-1 is, promote, is uh, a promoter of aging and disease and cancer, right? But nobody really knew to what degree. So the Walter Longo, they found this group of people living in Ecuador that had a, a mutation for the receptor for growth hormone, so they're unable to manufacture IGF-1. So as a consequence, they're, they're, they're dwarves. They're extremely short stature. You know, they do have some developmental problems, but they are virtually immune to cancer and diabetes. And they have a terrible lifestyle. They, they eat, you know, a terrible diet, high rates of alcoholism and smoking. And despite that, when they, they followed 300 of these people for 50 years and only found one case of cancer hmm. in that patient's hmm. and almost zero diabetes. So the importance of IGF-1 and the ketogenic diet or intermittent fasting tamps down IGF-1 levels, typically to almost imperceptible levels. Yeah, you know, and, and listen for this when you hear Tom talk here in an hour or so, you know, because I, I think there's magic behind being in ketosis and intermittent fasting. Tom talks about you don't get the benefit of the ketones until your glucose drops. So one of the things we look at is we want to see in our patients when they're intermittent fasting, dropping glucose and rising ketones as a signal that, hey, you know, this process that you just described is happening, right? Autophagy is happening. Stem cells are being produced. You know, so, you know, the dropping glucose, we often find that you need the restriction to create the glucose drop. So I always say don't eat less, eat less often, because when people think of restriction, they think of just eating less, like I'm going to eat less. And we know that doesn't work long term. But intermittent fasting, eating less often, creates that restriction, a drop in glucose, a rise in ketones. I think it puts the, the, the body in the perfect scenario for all that magic that you just described, <laughs> increasing stem cells, you know, the, you know, everything, the decrease in inflammation and the utilization of ketones for the brain, et cetera. That's the magic is intermittent fasting with ketones. At least that's what we found clinically. Yeah, yeah. And, and and the next layer, you know, just beyond, even beyond the, ener the energy of ketone bodies, which that was the initial focus of the research, was this, re they were so uh, energy dense. You know, you can get by, per unit of oxygen, the ketones generate, I think, twice as much energy as sugar. Yeah. Initial focus, and it does, the, the biochemistry is just beautiful. It, it, yeah. it 
energetic gap in the electron transfer chain, it packs your cells with ATP, which is the energy molecule of the cell. So that was the initial focus, but now it's it's going beyond that. And Tom was really, you know, it, very simple to understand. It's very intuitively pleasing to most people. They understand cancer loves sugar. And when you look at a PET scan, that's what you see. So when you switch to ketosis and drop blood sugar, you're starving the cancer cell, you know, and that's seductive in its line of reasoning. But now we know, irrespective of the glucose concentration, ketones are doing something else. And and as you alluded to earlier, they're operating on a genetic level. They're they're histone deacetylase inhibitors. And so for your, for your listeners, if you pull all your chromosomes out of a single cell and put them end to end, they're about three feet in length. So you have a ton of DNA and you're made of about 50 trillion cells. So that DNA is, is wrapped up incredibly tight and it's wrapped up on these proteins called histones. So beta hydroxybutyrate, the ketone body is affecting the modification of these histones, which is how epigenetics operates, how genes get turned on and turned off. So, and it's doing it, and it, I have no idea how this evolved, how this happens, but it does it in a way that completely tamps down all the important transcription factors that, that are active in cancer. It's, uh, the, the important healthiness of, of, a, of healthy cells. So it's the golden, it's the, you know, it's the holy grail of cancer therapies that it makes healthy cells more robust mm. while at the same time yeah. weak cancer cells. So it it's, creates this sort of, beautiful environment for other therapies to come in and work even better. I think what you said is perfect because you just kind of brought, we talked all about the science and what happens to the cell, you know, and the mitochondria, but the bottom line is cancer loves sugar. And that adaptation that's made, possibly the damage of, you know, from toxins in the mitochondria, it's relying on sugar. It's fermenting sugar, even in the presence of oxygen. We thought, okay, that is huge with cancer. However, we've learned now that by putting people in ketosis, Yes, it starts, we're switching the energy of the cell to be majority of fat. So if cancer cells love sugar, that's a problem for a cancer cell. So that's one benefit of ketosis. But the other benefit is what you just said, that now we're realizing that these ketones are actually turning off these genes and switching them over. And uh, I, I think it's amazing. Look, you know, when we look at the history, I love studying history. I, I, I get so much from ancient cultures. Every ancient culture on the planet has always had to go into ketosis at least once or twice through, you know, through a year's time for multiple reasons, whether it's lack of food, food shifts, who knows. But our DNA is set up to go into these ketotic states, which I believe, simply put, during these states, cleans up our DNA. It was, it's part of our D genome. We're meant to go into ketosis. However, today, because we have carbohydrates surrounding us in every fashion all the time 24 7 we aren't going into ketotic states and therefore we're building up a lot of bad genomes triggering by the toxins that are you know bad gene makes or bad cell makes bad cell and by going into ketosis periodically not even staying in it we're at at least turning off a lot of these bad genes this is missing in today that's my feeling i i couldn't agree more i think you perfectly characterize that. I think we, our bodies are completely adapted to do that periodically as a, as a cleaning house mechanism. And we've lost that, you know, when, when the agriculture yeah. came around 10,000 years ago, we became flush with food, especially carbohydrates. And most people probably don't enter ketosis in their lifetime in the Western world anyway. And so we, that's why we have this inexorable diabetes epidemic that's just getting worse and worse, you know, uh, and, and you can show this now on the epigenetic level, why this is happening. So yeah, going into ketosis reverses that. Yeah. It reverses all of these diseases of degeneration seem to funnel down to the same point of energy dysregulation that going into periodic ketosis concentrates its therapeutic effect. So yeah, you stated that beautifully. And I, I just, that's kind of the thrust of this whole conference is, you know, the questions are, okay, this is incredibly beneficial. What is, how, how do we get the most out of this? Do you need to be in ketosis all the time? And I think the answer to that is, you know, probably not. Probably just entering it occasionally is, is good enough. No, I, I, I've come up with a theory, you know, I call diet variation, aka feast famine cycles. And if you mention it to Joe, he'll come out of his skin because I actually helped Joe. I put that in his book. I was one of the content editors for his new book, Fat for Fuel. And, uh, you know, we talked about feast famine cycling because 
you know, my love for looking at ancient cultures, they were always forced into feast and famine cycles. The change, the adaptation, it, there's magic that happens in it. When you move from ketosis out of ketosis, uh, magic happens. I, we have found that this clinically, that we, people that are trying to move into ketosis are struggling for one reason or another, right? Just not able to make the transition, even though they're getting 20, 10 grams of carbs a day, they're just not getting into ketosis and months of trying. We move them out of ketosis. In a few months, move them back in and all of a sudden they're successful. You know, and it, it's just remarkable what happens, you know, in the change. I've got to read you this study. I, I, uh, I was, <clears throat> I found this study right here and um, I found it fascinating. I, I have to send it to you. So this is, um, it says a diet mimicking, uh, no, 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 that wasn't it. I did this last time I tried to find the darn study. Here it is. Okay, here it is right here. So it's, it's diet. This was actually on cancer prevention, diet individual responsiveness for cancer prevention. But in the study, in the abstract, it said, the last half century has brought stark changes in lifestyle that depart from normal diurnal cycling and periodic fluctuations in food availability. It says, th thus, modern times may be characterized by being constantly in a feast environment. The cellular consequences may be an increase in the risk for several diseases, including cancer. So the study is saying that, look, we're not getting these times of starvation, right? We're not getting times of ketosis production. Uh, we're not even varying our diet, and they're realizing it led to disease. Then I was uh, up in Wyoming, and I was researching the American Indians, and they realized that it's this not being in ketosis, and then this other diet in the summer, that it's part of why you know, they're triggering this gene of uh, you know, diabetes and heart disease. So anyways, just, you know, just stuff that uh, no one else is talking about, Travis. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just tell you one thing, too, that was fascinating to me is, you know, I'm a, this is the second year of this conference, and when I wrote the book, a lot of this stuff was clearly theoretical. There was preclinical data to right. support, and and especially with cancer research, and what we always have needed are just clinical. We need to get the ball rolling on clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And so I met. I was in London at a talk a while back, and I met this young MD from uh, Turkey. And Turkey has a much more permissive environment for treating cancer patients and stage cancer patients. The doctors are basically giving the given the permission to just do what they think is in the best benefit of the patient. So this young doctor got really enamored with Safreed's work. It made sense to him, and he's employed many of these therapies. So he puts his patients on a ketogenic diet. He has them fast before he has to give them chemotherapy as part of the standard of care. But they're they're given a dose range, and so he uses the lowest dose he can. Mm -hmm. Then he does. Um, then he does what's called 2-deoxyglucose, which if, if you you know read Tom's book, that's one of the drugs he looks at. It's a glycolytic inhibitor, so it stops mm -hmm. glucose from being utilized in the cell. He uses DCA, which is another metabolically acting small molecule. Um, then he gives extensive hypo, hyperbaric oxygen throughout this treatment and hypothermia. And he showed me his results. They did 50 patients with lung cancer. And the, the standard of care, the median survival with, with stage three, four lung cancer is 8.6 months. These guys are bringing their patients up to 41 months. And their patient population is, is brutal. It's a st stage four. So they get some of the worst you know, cases coming in. And wow. he's show, he was showing Tom and I these pictures of PET scans with these people just littered, you know, just lit up with cancer. And then after this protocol, they call it metabolically supported chemotherapy. And it's just gone, you know, and, and, and some of these patients, these remissions are so incredibly dramatic. So to me, this was, this is exactly what we need. We need these guys that are, can do this and can show this to the world. And because, because these therapies don't have the, the backing of pharmaceutical companies and they never will, it takes a billion dollars to get to the, the burden of proof for most oncologists, which is a double blind phase three, you know, placebo controlled trial. And there's no money to take these through those. So it's going to take these selfless, you know, bold oncologists to prove it in these trials on their own and then show the rest of the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, I hate to say this, I, you know, the need to pull the drug companies in uh, is almost needed because of the, the, the funding, the backing, the, you know, ju even just in the marketplace, getting this message out there. So if we can thinking different, 
like you said, glucose, more glucose blocking drugs, which, you know, there's, there's been some of these, they just haven't gained traction. But what about gluconeogenesis? Because Tom talks a lot about the metastatic cancers, you know, utilizing glutamine acid for energy, they adapt to that, you know, perhaps, you know, I know that yeah. he's experimenting with certain drugs that can limit, you know, glutamine reactions. What are your thoughts on that? Exactly. And that's, he was just bubbling last night because so we, my foundation is supported research where he's looking at a cocktail of therapies, right? And the missing piece to him was always glutamine because as much as cancer cells love sugar, they perhaps love glutamine even more. I mean, they, they, they can utilize glutamine as an energy substrate. And so blocking glutamine is more problematic because our immune systems need glutamine. So, but he's experimenting with this drug called Don, which is a very, very powerful glutamine inhibitor. And if you cycle it, it you can use way lower doses when, when uh, these m mice are on the ketogenic diet. So it's way more efficacious, like most drugs, when these mice are in a state of ketosis. And he's finding this is just devastating, the, the cancer cells. And he uses this brutally tough metastatic mouse model. It's notorious. They've never been able to cure it, you know. Right. So that getting so close to being able to almost cure this, this extremely hard mouse model. And now we have, I've you know, introduced him to this uh, Turkish doctor. So I hope that his protocol can go from preclinical to translational and uh, his clinic in Turkey, we can show, you know, what this drug, what this combination of stuff can do. So Travis, what are you working on right now? You know, there's a lot happening, you know, I mean, uh, that's great. You connected Tom to him and that's going to take this, you know, to the next level. What are you working on? You know, that, that kind of, these kind of things, um, uh, this is just taken on a life of its own. The, um, this, this conference went from a hundred and some people last year to over 400 this year, it just exploded. Many MDs are here that are, you know, sort of progressive in their thinking and are using these therapies and are just blown away by how well they're working. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, this is taking on a life of its own. Um, I'm working on a book now about epigenetics, which to me is, mm -hmm is, you know, I, I didn't realize how fascinating it was till I dug into it. So, and I think that's the next frontier of medicine. So that's where my, my focus is right now. Hey, Travis, even our thoughts can change that genome, right? Toxic thoughts, toxins, period. Oh, and <laughs> I feel like that. I, if you just look at a book called, um, uh, what's it, Beyond Something Telomeres, it just came out. Mm. And, and a wonderful book. And, you know, telomeres length at the end of chromosomes is related cellular health. It's, it's like an aging clock. Yeah, exactly. And wonderful series of studies about just stress and how we respond to stress, how positive we think circles back to telomere length. And it's incredible. I mean, uh, yeah, your mental state day to day affects your cellular health on, on a level I wasn't even aware of. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, we, we get a lot of very challenged people, uh, you know, my doctors and myself and, uh, you know, we know that physical, chemical and emotional stress turns on these bad genes uh, and it's a problem. Yeah. You know, I, I describe, I think you'll appreciate this. I talk about why people are getting sick today and the solution lies in, in this analogy as well. Think of a three legged stool, you know, every leg has to be there for it to stand up. Well, you have one leg that's the DNA, the epigenetic the genes are getting turned on because of these stressors, right? And that's the middle leg, the stressors that are turning on the genes. You know, this is a problem today <clears throat> from an emotional standpoint and a chemical standpoint. Then the last leg is the microbiome that's just being decimated right now that we know now this microbiome plays a big role in epigenetics. Uh, we're doing some new, new tests that, that show that, that we can literally measure the microbiome and realize then from that, from certain metabolites, what genes are actually being expressed. So what we're doing in our multi-therapeutic approach is we're doing everything that we know to turn off these bad genes. We're removing the stressors, which is key, you know, physical, chemical, and emotional. If you're doing all of it, you have a chance to turn these genes off. And lastly, we're affecting the microbiome with a lot of these ancient healing strategies, the fasting, the ketosis. There's going to be new research coming out on ketones effect on the microbiome. You know, we end with these fasting states when you starve down all bacteria. We talked about stem cells coming back. Same thing's happening in the microbiome. So when we starve down the microbiome, we're seeing these genetic changes within the bacteria. So the point is, is that when we put all of this together, we create disease. But when we put these, all these treatments together, 
you know, we're getting astounding results. And they, the key is, is putting it all together. So that might excite you, but that's what we're doing. We have a larger group of doctors. Well, yeah, I think the, the yeah. base of the base are catching up to what you really astute observational clinicians have known for a long time, you know. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, when you were saying that, it, in, in these ancient cultures, like you say, that have been onto this for a long time, I was thinking of a, of a story where somewhere in the desert where they get dysentery, a severe form of diarrhea, and the cure was to eat camel poop. Because it had, and then they finally, the basic scientists caught up to it, and like, yeah, there's some beneficial probiotics in this that they were clearly, you know, that's why it cured this, this state. And they knew this, you know, hundreds of years ago, and we just figured out why they were doing it. So. Yeah, uh, you know, the art of medicine, what you guys notice in your patients, um, uh, you, the basic science seems like sometimes it's catching up to that. Travis, think, think about this for a second. We know that the toxic exposures we're getting is turning on these genes epigenetically, right? And then the microbiome is being decimated. And we, we're just learning this connection of our microbiome and, you know, turning good genes on and bad genes off. You know, so you think about this complete assault to our microbiome, the chemicals and the genes that are being triggered. I mean, this is what's happening. I mean, honestly, this is why autoimmune conditions are just running rampant right now. And it's scary. And it, it's scary. And it's scary now because the science is showing that, you know, this begins in, in utero as you're forming. Oh. As, Speak of your mom goes to... Um, uh, you know, certain toxins, it, we now know it affects methylation patterns of DNA, which directly correlates to your propensity for obesity and all these problems later on. Even, you know, the vitamins your mom is exposed to, if you're, if you're, uh, if she was vitamin deficient in her first trimester or her last trimester, and then they follow these patients, these, these people and later, and they have certain disease patterns. So, Everything is, you know, everything along those lines is we're now finding out is just extraordinarily important. Yeah. And the microbiome is another layer of complexity on top of that. That um, it's scary things that there's some people that say, you know, we've probably wiped out, caused an extinction of important uh, gut bugs that we'll never get back. So, mm. yeah, it's time, far time we start paying more attention to that stuff. Yeah, no, no doubt. And, you know, the only solution is put all of it together, you know, and, you know, that's my passion, you know, is just getting a growing group of doctors, you know, doing this, uh, you know, that's, that's on the cutting edge. So, well, Meredith, I was so interested in this conversation that I've left you out of it. So I apologize, <laughs> but I better open it up to you for some questions. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, this has been an amazing interview to you and Travis, what a wealth of knowledge. I'm so excited to, to learn more about your research on epigenetics and wondering if you could maybe share or tease us with kind of any of the, the specifics you're working on with that book. Oh man, I'm right in the middle of it. It's to me. Okay. Well, just a broad, for me, the broadness of it is what I would say is these all these epigenetic changes that we see in DNA, there's there's certain levels, there's transcription factor levels. So if you walk outside, and you manufacture vitamin D, vitamin D then is, is a transcription factor it binds to a, a receptor in your nucleus and then by, binds to what's called vitamin D response elements sprinkled throughout your genome. And that flickers about 913 genes to life. So just oh. walking out changes your epigenome. And these genes are involved in innate immunity. It also flickers to it grossly upregulates a gene that that turns tryptophan into serotonin. So when you that's why you feel good when you go out in the sun. Your your thoughts soften. You know the edges of stress soften. So it's directly correlated to your mental state, and that's just walking outside. So that's one layer of the epigenome. The next is the the way your DNA gets wrapped up, as we talked about beta hydroxybutyrate can affect that the packaging of DNA. Then DNA itself gets tagged with, with little groups called methyl groups, and this affects genes. And so when you are conceived, all these methyl groups are wiped off. You're a clean slate. And then you get they get attached as you grow in utero, and then you're born tuned up. Your epigenome is tuned up to express the right genes. But as we age, and as we're exposed to certain environmental toxins and so forth, that these tags get drifted. And so we start yeah regulation and genetic expression. Now, to me, that where this all goes is, can you reverse that? And the, the, the science is leading us to believe that it can be reversed. Yeah. yeah, so that that to me is, I mean, 
this is where we could possibly intervene on aging. And we, we parse diseases up into, you know, distinct processes when really these are all converge on aging itself. The, the, by far the highest risk factor for, for uh, cancer is aging. It's not smoking. So if we can intervene on this process, we could single-handedly wipe out the whole spectrum of degeneration from cancer to neurodegeneration and all these things. So that's where this our focus should be, not parsing up diseases and trying to understand the pathology of each one. It should be intervening on this epigenetic level. So, it, you know, it's so broad, this topic, and it, it's so meaningful that it's, it's overwhelming. I, I just had a thought when you said about, you know, just being in the sun and, you know, <clears throat> ultimately how that uh, can turn off bad genes, right? I mean, it upregulate good ones. I mean, that's just amazing. And well, you're, yeah. you're, you're friends with Joe, right? So you'll yeah. him. He's one conference. Oh, yeah. I think he was and he's got these glasses on. I mean, he's he's living the he's walking outside to get sun every five minutes. And oh, yeah, yeah. he drags me on those walks. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden I'm sweating and, you know, it's like, you know, we, we got to get the sun right. But, uh, you know, but he, yeah, he, he's funny. He, he lives what he preaches, no doubt about it. But, you know, think about this for a second. You know, we, we you know, just part of my research with the American Indians it was that that thing of going into ketosis in the winter. But in the summer, just like the Hunza people, they thought they were vegetarians. I mean, you know, they weren't eating as much meat, you know, it's like, you know, as people would have thought, right? They were relying on all these different root vegetables, which arguably would be a higher carbohydrate diet. But yet the sun had a huge effect on why they were able to tolerate that higher carbohydrate diet. Think about this. When we go into winter, when there's less sun, what's protecting our genome? The ketones the ketones, right? The sun can protect the genome more in the better times, you know, which could tolerate us being out of ketosis. But in the winter, you know, the ketones protect us. Uh, just a thought of seasonal, you know, ketosis. But anyways, that's, that'll take us down a whole nother route. Meredith, I better turn it back to you or him and I may go all day. <laughs> I know. We might have to do a part two. It's such a fascinating conversation. And just in closing, Travis, thank you so much. And I'm just wondering, what would you say if someone is watching this or listening and got a recent cancer diagnosis or, or has a loved one who, who did, what would you, what would you tell them? You know, I, I, I think, for, for the most proactive people do the best. So if you can empower yourself through just learning about these, about treatments like this, about, you know, using this dietary therapy and hopefully your oncologist is on board because the, the re, like Walter Longo just gave a talk. If you can get into ketosis or fast before chemotherapy, potentially this is going to greatly increase the efficacy of it and, and mitigate side effects. And he's done a wonderful clinical trial where they've shown that even objective side effects like vomiting and hair loss are incredibly diminished when you're in ketosis. So, um, you know, empowered patients, I think, do the best. I'm sure you can attest to that. Uh, so that that's where I'd say start is just get as much information you can and and try to use it, you know, with your oncologist if it's possible. Yeah. Well, great, great advice. Thank you, Travis. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pampa. Thank you, Travis, for sharing your knowledge. This is just such exciting information. And hopefully maybe we can have you back and delve into epigenetics a little bit more once that book's out. Absolutely. Yep. Let's jump into epigenetics. Tell our friends over there, hello. I'm glad you're there. Yeah. All right. I sure will. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Travis. Thanks, Dr. Pampa. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Have an awesome weekend, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.